All right, next up we have the endocrine glands. This is a really fun chapter, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, we're going to be learning about a lot of different feedback systems. So we're going to learn about negative and positive feedback systems and how we are able to maintain and control homeostasis through the endocrine system. So um, in this first section, we're going to just do an overview of the endocrine glands. So the endocrine system is going to be um, responsible for coordinating body systems and helping to maintain homeostasis. So the endocrine system works in harmony with the nervous system. It is a much more leisurely system of communication than the nervous system because we have to wait for um, uh, the hormones to diffuse to wherever it is they need to go throughout the body in order to impact whatever systems they need to. But it does work um, in tandem with the nervous system to help maintain homeostasis. So the endocrine glands contain secretory cells that release their products, which are typically hormones, into extracellular fluid, where they can then diffuse into the bloodstream. Now, hormones are one type of chemical messenger that's found in the body. Exocrine glands secrete their products into ducts, which lead to the body surfaces or cavities or spaces within organs. So things like oil and salivary glands are examples of exocrine systems, exocrine glands. Um, Hormones are going to most frequently travel in the bloodstream, um, and they're going to come into contact with virtually all cells, but they typically affect only one particular type of cell called the target cells. The target cells have receptors, which are protein molecules that recognize and bind to specific hormones. So if you remember way on back when we talked about um, all of the different cell structures of the cell membrane, and we talked about all the different features of the cell main membrane, there are cell recognition proteins that are found on the surface of the cell membrane that specifically respond to these chemical messengers that get sent to them. Um, so cells other than target cells usually lack the correct receptors and are unaffected by that hormone. So that hormone could wash through the entire body, but it's only going to affect the cells that have the specific um, cell receptors or have the specific protein receptors bound on the outside of that cell membrane. So here is just kind of an overview of some of the different organs that we're going to be talking about in the endocrine system. Um, spend a little bit of time at the end of this chapter reviewing this diagram, um, but we're going to move on from it for now. But it's a fantastic uh, study tool to help you make sure that you've understood and you learned all of the different organs involved in this system. All right, so like I said, there are two main types of glands, exocrine and endocrine. Exocrine glands secrete their products into ducts. Endocrine glands secrete their products into the bloodstream, which delivers them throughout the body. Like I said, only target cells are going to respond to that hormone, and they have specific receptor proteins for that hormone. Here's an example of what that looks like. So here we have our hormone. It's being released from the bloodstream, and it's going to bind to the specific receptors found on the target cells. Now the non-target cells do not have the correctly shaped um, protein receptor, so they won't pick up that message. So hormones are an excellent means of communication between cells, between body parts, and even between individuals. Most of them act at a distance from where they are secreted. So most of them have to be secreted into the bloodstream and then travel throughout the body. Um, they often affect the metabolism of cells that have the receptors uh, that bind them. Local hormones will affect neighboring cells. They're not typically carried elsewhere in the bloodstream. So things like prostaglandins and growth factors, and we'll break those down a little bit later. Um, pheromones influence the behavior of other individuals. So this is a hormone. It's a way to communicate between individuals. So things like, or not things, uh, individual animals tend to rely heavily on pheromones to mark their territory and attract mates. Uh, humans also produce pheromones that are capable of sending messages back and forth between individuals. Hormones have a wide range of effects on the target cells. Um, typically, they're going to increase the uptake of particular substances like glucose, or they can argue alter the target cell structure in some way, um, or they can influence that cell's metabolism. And we're going to talk about all of these different features a little bit later on when we talk about specific hormones. Um, here's an example of another hormone. Um, we do have steroid hormones and peptide hormones. Peptide hormones um, are, uh, can anybody take a guess, see if you can guess, what is a what group of biomolecule does peptide hormone belong to? Well, if you said proteins, very good, excellent. Peptide hormones are protein hormones. Um, they're peptides, proteins, glycoproteins, um, or modified amino acids. So they're going to belong to the, um, the protein family. 
Uh, things like this would be a good example of this would be like growth hormone. Growth hormone is a protein that is produced and secreted by the anter anterior pituitary gland. Steroid hormones, does anybody remember what group of biomolecules steroids belong to? If you said lipids, you got it right. Very good. Steroids are going to be lipids derived from cholesterol. So they all have some the same sort of complex structure of that four carbon ring. Um, so if you remember uh, way on back when we talked about uh, steroid hormones, we talked about how estrogen and testosterone are both examples of steroid hormones that are derived from that four ring, basic four ring structure of cholesterol. Like I said, most hormones are peptide hormones. Their, acting, their actions can kind of vary depending on their target cell um, and depending on what is needed. So when a hormone, like example, when the hormone epinephrine binds to a receptor on a muscle cell, it's going to break down glycogen to produce glucose for ATP production. So this is going to occur in a series of steps. First, cyclic adenosine monophosphate is going to be formed. This is going to activate a, pro a protein kinase enzyme in the cell, which is going to activate another cell. I'm sorry, going to activate another enzyme, which will activate another enzyme, which will activate another, another enzyme. This is what's called an enzyme cascade, where we initiate or activate a first enzyme, which is going to activate a second enzyme, which is going to activate a third enzyme and start the cascade until we can until we get the signaling molecule to start breaking down that glycogen to produce glucose. Peptide hormones themselves never enter the target cell. If you can see here, here's our original hormone. It's going to bind to this receptor, and then it's going to, um, and that receptor is going to start off a cascade, a chain of events, but this hormone itself never actually enters the cell. So the hormone is just called the first messenger. Uh, the C camp, or the C amp, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, um, sets the metabolic machinery in motion is called the secondary um, messenger. So we have a primary messenger, a first messenger, which is going to s initiate or activate that first enzyme, and then that's going to start the, the whole cascading event. Now we do also have steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are going to be found only in, in the adrenal cortex, ovaries, and testes. Um, the thyroid hormones belong to a class of molecules called amines, which act very similarly um, to the steroid hormones. Now the steroid hormones are a little bit different. They do not bind to the plasma membrane. So there aren't receptors found on the surface of the plasma membrane. They tend to be hydrophobic. So they, uh, because they are those lipids, because they are um, part of that lipid group. They're hydrophobic. They have no interest in being in the solution in the water anyway, so they can pass through that cell membrane very easily. They can cross through that plasma membrane, and once inside, they're going to bind to a receptor in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. So they don't bind to the surface of the cell. They're going to bind to a receptor found inside of the cell. Inside the nucleus, the hormone receptor complex is going to bind to DNA and activate certain genes. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, is going to move to the ribosomes, and then we're going to start to synthesize proteins. In general, steroid hormones act much more slowly than peptide hormones because it takes more time to synthesize new proteins than to just activate enzymes that are already present. So in the case of our peptide hormones, all we're doing is activating a bunch of proteins that are already present, activating enzymes that are already present. In the case of a steroid hormone, we need to actually synthesize new proteins. We're going to spend a lot of time going over the process of protein synthesis in a later chapter, so I'm not going to get into that now. All you need to know is that we turn on certain genes, and those genes, your DNA, codes for the synthesis of proteins. So, um, they're so t generally speaking, steroid hormones tend to be a little bit slower, but they tend to have much more long term effects. They tend, their action tends to typically last a little bit longer. All right, so that's just sort of an overview of our hormones. You should be able to state the role of a hormone and compare and contrast the nervous and endocrine systems with regard to function and the types of signals used. We've already spent a whole chapter talking about the nervous system and those impulses, um, and now we've just given you a very brief overview of the endocrine system. So just generally speaking, you should be able to compare and contrast um, the way that those two systems work to help maintain our homeostasis. Um, you should also be able to summarize some of the differences between peptide hormones and steroid hormones. Um, 
And you don't need to worry about why second messenger systems are needed for peptide hormones. Um, I guess, I mean, I, you can. Uh, it just comes down to those, sec those peptides uh, do not enter the cell. So because they don't enter the cell, instead they, they'll just trigger a uh, cascade of events, which is why they need a secondary messenger system found within the cell because they cannot cross the cell membrane themselves. All right, that's it for chapter 16.1. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments.